I'm Len Riskin. I'm a law professor and a mediator, and I'll be the mediator in the following demonstration. But before we start the demonstration, I'd like to give you a little background. Mediation is an informal process in which the parties to a dispute or their representatives seek to negotiate a solution to their problem with the help of an impartial third party. Unlike a judge or an arbitrator, the mediator has no authority to impose a solution. Instead, the mediator facilitates and structures the communication between the parties. The process usually results in an agreement. Americans are long familiar with mediation's use in labor and international disputes, but since the early 1980s, there has been a vast increase in the scope and volume of mediation in other areas, such as divorce and child custody matters, environmental and other public disputes, insurance claims, and in a variety of business and corporate matters. Mediation is sponsored by trial and appellate courts and by for-profit and not-for-profit organizations. Mediators themselves come from a wide variety of backgrounds. There are many different approaches to mediation. The approach used depends on many factors, including the nature of the dispute, the relationships among the parties, the personalities of the parties and of the mediator, and the degree of crisis. But in virtually all mediations, there are five tasks that must be accomplished. The parties must first agree to mediate. Second, the parties and the mediator must come to understand the problems that brought them into the mediation and the problems they will face in working together. Third, they must generate options aimed at resolving the problems. Fourth, they must reach an agreement. And fifth, they must implement the agreement. In this videotape, I mediate between a commercial landlord and a tenant as they work to resolve a dispute concerning their lease. Although lawyers are present in many mediations, in this mediation, the parties are not accompanied by lawyers. In the first segment, we deal with the task of agreeing to mediate. Well, good morning. My name is Len Riskin. Hi, I'm Anne LaRue. Anne? I'm uh, Frank Lawrence. Len. Frank, nice to meet both of you. Did you have any trouble finding the office? No problem. Good. Have either of you been involved before in a mediation? No, um, huh. I haven't. Why don't I tell you a little bit about it? Well, before you do, let me tell you that uh, I talked to my lawyer about this deal, and uh, I've got a pretty good idea of what my legal rights are. And I don't want you deciding this case in a way that's going to give up some valuable rights I've got under this lease. I'm glad you raised that, Frank. Uh, it leads me into some things I wanted to explain about mediation. The main thing being that this is going to be an inform informal process in which we'll discuss the problem that you're having. And my job is not to decide the case. That An arbitrator would do that or a judge would do that. Uh, my job is to try to help the two of you work out your own resolution. Well, so you don't actually make a decision yourself here? That's right. Oh. That's right. It's your case. It's, it uh, is a problem that uh, the two of you will most likely be able to work out. My job is to help you. Okay. okay? And I should add uh, that I'm not here as a lawyer. While I may be able to help you identify some legal issues, I am, in fact, a lawyer, but my job here today is to be a mediator. And so I won't be telling you about what your legal rights are. I won't be telling you about what's likely to happen in court. On the other hand, you should appreciate that we have a lot more flexibility here than a judge would have in court. A judge is very limited in terms of what he or she can order, whereas here we can work something out that will make sense for the two of you. Okay? Sure. Um, because I'm a mediator in this case, I would not be able to represent either one of you in any case as a lawyer, in any case related to this in any way. Now, why don't I say something about the process that will follow? which is that I'll ask uh, each of you to make a presentation of your view of what happened here and to say something about what you would like to happen. I'll ask Frank to go first because Frank initiated the mediation proceeding and then I'll ask Anne to go second. And while the other person is talking, if you have something that you just have to say, please write it down on the paper I put in front of you. I'd like you each to have uninterrupted time to get out your story so that all three of us can understand how each of you sees the case. And finally, I should say that uh, these proceedings are confidential. They're confidential in the sense that there's a statute in this state. There's a law to the effect that if 
the two of you should wind up in court over this matter, that neither of you can introduce any statements uh, that were made by the other party or were made by me in this proceeding. And the law also provides that if the two of you sign an agreement to mediate, then you can't compel me to testify in court and reveal any information of, in connection with this proceeding. And that's why, in order to protect the confidentiality of a mediation, I always ask the parties to sign an agreement to mediate. I sent to both of you a copy last week of that agreement. Did you have a chance to look at it? Yeah, yeah it looked fine any, to me. Any problem? No, I, I just had one question. I haven't talked to an attorney. Now, I didn't realize I needed to. I mean, should I have talked to one before I came in? Not necessarily. I would encourage you to have a lawyer talk to you about this matter at some point. You might decide, actually in the middle of this mediation, that you need legal advice. Or if we reach an agreement, you might want to have it reviewed by, the, by a lawyer before, uh, before you sign it. So it doesn't have to be binding as of today. I don't have to be stuck with... I mean, I can have somebody look at it sure. before it... Sure. We could reach uh, an agreement in principle, and uh, you could consult with an attorney afterwards okay. bef before you sign it, before it becomes final. Before I obtained the party's signatures on the agreement to mediate, I told them that later I might decide to meet with each of them privately in what is known as a caucus. I explained that anything they told me in the caucus would be confidential unless they gave me permission to reveal it to the other person. In dealing with the task of agreeing to mediate, I had five objectives. The first was to educate the parties about the mediation process. They had to understand the mediator's role and how the process would work, including the steps in the process, its confidential nature, and the role of law and lawyers. Second, I had to set the tone for the ensuing discussions and respond to questions and concerns. Third, I wanted them to begin to develop trust in my competence and impartiality. Fourth, as mediator, I had to begin making judgments about whether this case and these parties were suitable for mediation. This is a complicated judgment, which might be made in pre-mediation discussions or even later in the mediation. Finally, all three of us had to make a commitment to enter the mediation process. The next segment deals with task number two, understanding the problems. I began by asking each of the parties to explain how they saw the situation. Why don't we start then with Frank. Uh, Frank, why don't you start in the beginning? Uh, tell us what, uh, what happened, how you see this, and what you'd like to happen. Okay, well, it's, it's really a pretty simple case. Um, I'm a landlord. I own a number of uh, commercial buildings in town. And I've got this particular building down near the University Stadium. And it's been used for a lot of different things, basically commercial use. And uh, it's been vacant for a while. I wanted to rent it. Uh, Anne approached me and she said she's going to start this uh, Red Devil restaurant. You know, they're a big franchise outfit. And I figured, well, that's a pretty good deal. Uh, we talk about the rent. She needs some things fixed up in the building. Uh, to meet the special needs of that particular company, and so I make some improvements. We sign the lease. In fact, I got the lease right here, and her signature's on it. You won't have any trouble seeing that. And she agrees to pay me a certain amount of rent, and everybody seems happy. She orders her equipment. I think she's about ready to open for business. And then, well, I guess, what, maybe a month ago, she contacts me, and she says, well, the deal is off. And I can't believe this. I mean, she's signed a lease. She's not going to go through with it? Well, I'm, I'm a little perturbed, to put it mildly. So I sent her a letter. And I said, Ann, you've got to perform the lease. I, I listed in the letter what she owes me. And basically, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do what she agreed to do. I wanted to, wanted to fulfill her obligation. And how much was it that you asked for in the letter? Well, look, you got how five. How much was it that I you asked for let's, in okay, the letter? So, like, um, right, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what yeah, it was. I'd like Frank to set out his version of what happened. Let's, well, let's well, hear I'll tell you how what Frank it sees it. Look, she got five years of rent. She agreed to pay me a thousand a month plus three percent of gross sales in the restaurant. So you add that up over five years, figure a reasonable amount of gross sales, add in the amount I spent fixing up the place, it comes to more than eighty thousand dollars. So he writes me a letter for eighty thousand dollars. Yes, that's so exactly the letter right. said 
you owe me eighty thousand dollars. That's what she owes me. That's what that's, it says. Our signatures on the lease. And you sent this letter about uh, uh, how long ago? What, ten days, two weeks ago, something like that. Did you say you spent money to uh, improve the premises? Yeah, that they wanted to put a sign on the roof, so I had to reinforce the roof. Had to change the windows in the front a little. They've got a certain kind of architectural style that they like to have in their restaurant. They meaning the Red oh, Devil Dog. Yeah, yeah, the, the franchise people. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, uh, so I spent, uh, I'd say, twenty five hundred bucks. Twenty five, I see. Mm -hmm. And the eighty thousand. Uh, uh, well, you've explained how you calculated that. So yes. you sent a letter to Ann saying you owe me eighty thousand dollars yeah, if, you, if you're not going to perform this lease. Well, no, I, that's and performance. That, I mean, that's, that's what she agreed to do. Uh -huh. I understand what, what you're saying. Um, and has there been any further communication? No, I haven't heard anything further from her. This was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and how would, what, I, what would you like to happen here? I'd like to have her do what she promised to do in the lease. I'd like to have her, I mean, she's welcome to the space. I, she signed a lease. She's entitled to it. And she's obligated to pay me the rent. It's just that simple in my book. Okay. Anything else that you'd like to say, Frank? No, that's it. And how do you see this? Well, I mean, essentially, I did enter into a lease with him. But I entered into a lease to open a Red Devil Dog restaurant that's in the lease. The, you know, the franchise, the corporation went bankrupt. I had no control over that. The lease was to have a Red Devil Dog restaurant. I can't perform on that. Well, because come on, I Ann. It's not, my, it's not my fault. The, the lease Frank, was Frank, Red Frank, Devil let's Dog. let Ann finish. And I, I can't do it now because Red Devil Dog went under. I, and that wasn't my fault. There was nothing I could do about that. Um, so I, I can't perform for that simple reason. Look, I don't care if it says Red Devil Dog at the top. She's entitled to have the space for a restaurant. And she's obligated to pay me the rent. I thought it was my turn. It is. Mine. It is. Frank, well, please. Well, I, at any rate, I can't do Red Devil Dog because they went under. And that's what I entered into the lease to do was to run a Red Devil Dog restaurant. And without that franchise... You know, I don't have anything left. I can't really run any kind of, of restaurant, I wouldn't think. Um, the fix-ups. Okay, so he spent $2,500 getting it in a suitable shape for anybody to move into, practically. Reinforced the roof some. Like he said, made some changes. None of those are going to injure whoever else moves in there. It wasn't anything he had to... I mean, it wasn't any special deal. Yeah, but they weren't me. that necessary. I made them for your... Well, it was in crummy shape. Well, well let's... A Frank, reinforced roof Frank. isn't going to hurt anybody. Go um, ahead. Ed. Well, and then I, I bought equipment. Uh, I bought some grills and different things I'd need for cooking the food and countertops and booths and things like that. I spent about nine thousand dollars of my own money, and I had those brought in. And he's got them in there, and he's changed the locks, so I can't get to them. If I don't return those within two weeks, I'm going to lose probably about half the money on it. Now wait a minute. This thing about changing the locks. She makes it sound like I'm some, some kind of bad guy. Well, you changed the locks. Of course I changed my equipment them. that I paid for with yeah. my money. All right, but I don't want somebody breaking in there, stealing the stuff. If, the if old they locks stuff, were I'll just be... fine. The oh. old locks were just fine. Yeah, okay, but what do I know? You'll go in and remove the stuff, and then I've got nothing. Well, I gather what the issue is is who has... Uh who has control over this equipment. That's, well, isn't that what I'm you're talking about? You, you want the equipment back, I want the equipment back because I'm going to lose a lot of money on it if I don't resell it back to him, if I don't return it, rather. Well, I'm just trying to protect myself. In the myself. next two weeks. You have, so you have to return it within two weeks. Or, or I lose, I, then I have to sell it on the, on the used equipment market, and evidently you don't get much for, for your equipment, even if it's brand new. It's still in the boxes. It's never been used. But I'll lose, like, maybe even 50% on it. So it's important to you to get the equipment back quickly. Yeah, because That's money is one of your is major goals. Very tight. Okay, go go ahead. What else is uh, what else is going on? Um, well, I paid a two thousand dollar deposit, um, which wasn't even asked for in the lease. I did it just as a you know a showing of good faith on my part because I had no idea that the corporation was going to go under. I am not. I didn't enter into this just on a la di da whim. I had really been wanting to do this, and and I was very honest in my intentions to do it. Um, so I went ahead and I gave him a two thousand dollar deposit, and I'd like that back. Um, you what, know, what it she wasn't really wants to do is to walk away from this deal. Did you notice that? She said, "Give me back my equipment. Give me back my two thousand dollars. Bye, bye, Mr. Landlord." That's her story. You're right. And what have you lost out on? That place has been empty forever. I had no idea that the corporation was going to go bankrupt. We agreed and that it's a I would have a lease. It's I had a lease, lease to perform a to have hold, a Red Devil Dog hold, restaurant. Hold I everything. Can't. Hold everything. It's not it my fault. Sounds like sounds like what we're talking about is that you're both 
interested in ending the relationship and that Anne really wants her equipment back quickly and Frank wants some money. Well, you know, what I really wanted was her to go ahead with the lease. If she can't do it, she's caused me some significant harm. I've got a vacant building. I've got a bunch of improvements that nobody else cares about one way or the other. I mean, maybe we could arrive at some settlement, but it's got to give me something to compensate me for having to go out and find a new tenant. I mean, the, the place was vacant six months before Ann rented it. It could be vacant another six months or another year. I mean, tenants that need this particular space are not that common. How do I know how long it's going to sit there generating zero? Before so you, I came along, you didn't have anything anyway. That's right, but you signed the deal. Well, it sounds like you're both in a difficult spot, and what I'd like to do is meet privately with each of you and talk a little further, and then we can all meet together. If that's okay with both of you, I'd like to meet first with Anne. Yeah, all right. The parties and the mediator must come to understand two sets of problems. The first set of problems are the external circumstances and events that brought the parties into the mediation. Here we learned about the lease and what prompted Anne to terminate it. The second set of problems are internal. The troubles the parties will have in the mediation, in working together and in working with me. In the session we have just watched, one of the problems I noticed was that Frank was taking an extreme position, asserting it loudly and insistently and ignoring Anne's viewpoint. At the same time, Anne seemed soft-spoken and willing to listen. I was concerned about the power balance between the parties, and I also worried about how I would maintain my own impartiality under the circumstances. In dealing with the task of understanding the problems, the principal technique I used was to give each party time to explain how they saw the situation. This got out a great deal of information, but I also permitted them a bit of leeway to interrupt each other for two reasons. First, it allowed them to express and release their anger, which otherwise might have gotten in the way of subsequent negotiations. Second, I wanted to give them a chance to work together, if they could, to develop their own solution, and if they wished, to improve their relationship. I don't always hold private caucuses in a mediation, but here I thought that it was important to do so for several reasons. First, I thought that Frank was posturing and that it would be difficult for him to back away from his position in a joint session. Second, I suspected that his negotiating strategy might be counterproductive. Third, and most important, up to this point, the dispute had developed a very narrow focus. Whether Anne could and would pay enough to satisfy Frank so that he would return the equipment. Some mediators would have proceeded, with or without a private caucus, to help the parties compromise on this issue, and that would have ended the mediation. But I felt that in order to help them reach an agreement that responded to their real interests, all three of us had to better understand these interests. So, Anne, this must have been an awful experience for you. It must be an awful experience for you. It really, it's really been <laughs> terrible. I didn't expect any of this, and it's all just happened over the last four to six weeks. It's, I've... <laughs> I think I'm probably pretty much still in shock. The whole thing has happened. I I'd like really to believe. I'd like to try to understand a little more about where you, where things are. Did you have to invest any money to get the franchise? Yeah, I uh, I took twenty thousand of my personal uh, funds, and I got a bank loan for twenty thousand uh, in order to buy the franchise. And, uh, you know, I mean, I did do some checking around and everything about Red Devil Dog, and nobody, I had no idea. They've been around for years. I had no idea um, they were going to go under. Mm. Never, <laughs> obviously, I never would have invested that kind of money. Sure, sure. And you also spent $9,000 or so on equipment? Yeah. This was, that was your also, own money? That was also out of my savings. That was my, my own personal funds, and that's why I really want to get that equipment back so that I can get full price for it. I sure. I don't have any money left. You don't have any I, money left? You know, maybe a thousand dollars. I just don't uh, have much in the bank. And are you working yeah. at the moment? Yeah. 
Ann told me she was a nurse in the cardiology unit of the university hospital where she had worked for eight years. When I asked how she had become interested in the restaurant business, she explained that she had grown up in a family that owned restaurants and that she had worked in them as a cook and a hostess. She also had worked part-time as the manager of a fast food restaurant. Ann said she was a skilled cook but lacked business experience, so she relied heavily on her brother-in-law, an accountant, for business advice. What would you like to happen here? Um, well... I know we've been talking about uh, ending the relationship, but I guess what I'd like to, to get a sense of is what, what are your plans in the future? It sounds like you were wanting to change from nursing and move into a restaurant business. Yeah. Do you still hope to do that? Um, well, I'd, I'd really like to. I mean, I love nursing uh, quite a bit, but it just kind of feels like it's time for a change, and I know it's something I can always go back to. I learned that Ann had won an award for her Cajun cooking, and that her real dream was to open her own Cajun restaurant, but she did not think that was possible under the circumstances. She also said that if Frank sued her successfully, she probably would have to declare bankruptcy. So what I'm gathering is that you're in a pretty bad financial situation yeah. that you'd like, if you could, to open a restaurant. Are you, so am I, am I correct in understanding that if you could, you'd like to, would you like to use this space? I don't want to put ideas in your head, is it, but have you been thinking about that? Not really. <laughs> um, it was a, and it was I have a, no idea whether, whether Frank would yeah. be even open to something like that. Anne said that she had not thought of using the space, but that the idea was appealing, although the space was not ideal for a Cajun restaurant. I offered to present the idea to Frank, and she agreed, although she thought he would laugh at it. Finally, Anne indicated that there was nothing in our discussions that I had to keep confidential from Frank. Next, I met with Frank. Well, Frank, I had an interesting meeting with Anne. Yeah, well, did she admit all that stuff that I told you? Well, Frank, uh, I don't think the two of you disagree about the facts about what happened, but I wanted to ask you a, a couple of questions. You called up a couple of weeks ago and said you wanted... Uh, to have a mediation, and I'm wondering what motivated you oh, to do that. Yeah, well, uh, really it was my lawyer. See, I went to see him, and uh, I told him about this case, and he said, well, you got a terrific case there, but you'd probably save some money if you went to a mediator instead of going to court. And then he mentioned your name to me. I see. And, and he told you that you had a very strong case? Yeah, well, um, actually, he said I had a pretty good case, uh, might have some problems here, you know, like the fact that I locked up her equipment would maybe count against me. But he thought it was a pretty good case, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you write the letter before you saw your lawyer or after you saw your lawyer? Um, I wrote it after, but the lawyer didn't help me write it. I, oh, I, I just figured, uh, well, you know, if you're going to take a stance, let's take a strong stance, a, a sort of a negotiating posture or whatever you call that. I see. And um, I, I gather you've been in business for a while and that's one of your strategies, to come on pretty strong when you're well, negotiating? Well, yeah, I don't let people walk all over me. Uh, in other words, I figure uh, you, you let people know what you want them to do. You don't always get 100% of what you ask for, but why not ask? Sure, sure, I understand that. Yeah. Uh, do you have any sense of how that uh, affects Anne? Huh, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, I, actually, I guess she probably doesn't relate very well to people like that. I have that feeling also. Um, mm -hmm. So you might think about that when we get back together. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention to you is uh, is this. I was talking to Anne, um, and she told me she's really not in uh, very good financial condition. She had to borrow pretty much money, about $20,000 to pay for this franchise, and she used about an equal amount of her own money, and then she paid for this equipment, which she said was about 9000 and yeah. uh, she indicated to me that she's pretty much out of money. Mm. And uh, yeah. I, as a businessman, I'm sure you know that uh, sometimes you can get a judgment in court and may not be able to, to recover. 
Well, yeah, I mean, the way I always put it is you can't get blood out of a beat, especially a dead beat. Uh, well, I understand what you're saying, Frank, and uh, I thought it's important that you know what she told me about her financial well, now, now, condition. So, she, so she's pretty shaky, you think? That's what she indicated to me, oh, yes, wow. that, uh, that she's almost out of money. She's actually thinking about, she said she thought if, if you actually sued her and got a judgment that she would have to declare bankruptcy. Oh, boy. Well, if she does that, uh, you know, chances are I'll never get much of anything out of her. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, think, I think that's, that's right. I thought it was important that you know that. Um, Frank, what are, are your plans for the property? Oh, well... Okay, now this is confidential, right? Sure, I mean, sure. this, this doesn't yes. go to Ann unless I say so. Frank then told me that he had a written offer from a national fast food chain called Grandpa's Beans to rent the space for $600 plus 1.5% of gross receipts per month. He said that because Grandpa's Beans would promote the business, it was possible for him to receive as much as $1,000 per month after the first few months. You may recall that the rent in the original lease with Ann was for $1,000 plus 3% of gross. Frank admitted that this was much more than he had ever received before. In order to help Frank better understand Ann, I explained that she was a nurse at the university hospital, came from a family of restaurateurs, and was an accomplished cook with a special interest in Cajun food. Frank indicated that he had tasted her Cajun cooking and enjoyed it. It would interest you to know that one of the things that uh, Anne would like to do sometime in her life is to have a Cajun restaurant. Cajun, huh? That's interesting. I don't think we've got one in town anywhere. I don't think so either. Uh, and you know, that's pretty, being pretty popular around the country. I've been reading about that. It was in the New York Times and all mm -hmm. this. Uh, uh, this Cajun thing is really making it big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, this town could probably uh, support a Cajun restaurant pretty well. I, I, good luck to her, I'd say, on that. Well, would it make any sense to talk about the possibility of opening that Cajun restaurant in your premises? Hmm. Gee, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that might be all right. I mean, uh, I, I think the concept would probably sell in this market. Mm -hmm. And as I say, she's a wonderful cook. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'd be willing to consider that. But now, bear in mind, she's got to pay me substantial rent. I, mean, I don't necessarily have to have maybe that 1,000 plus 3%. That was... I was a little on the high side, frankly. Mm -hmm. I, I think I could uh, concede something off that, but, but on the other hand, I don't want to give the place away either. I mean, I've got Grandpa's beans there. Sure. And so, yeah, if she made me an attractive offer on the rent, I'd be willing to talk to her about that. Okay, so I think when we get together again, the three of us, we could talk about that as an option uh, along with the other option, which is somehow severing the relationship, which yeah. is what we were talking about before. When I asked Frank if there was anything he wanted me to hold in confidence, he mentioned that he did not want me to reveal the terms of the offer from Grandpa's Beans, though he did want Ann to know that he had received an offer from that company. I'll be happy to respect that confidence. Uh, in fact, I think it would probably be best if you told her about the fact that you have an offer. Um, and the other thing I want to suggest to you is you might decide during the course of our discussions that you'd like to let her know the terms of your offer from Grandpa's Beans. It might be, for example, that if you're going to get uh, the kind of rent that you feel you want, you might have to tell her what your options are so, mm. that, so that she'll understand where you stand. Yeah, I see what you but mean. But that would be up to you. Okay, let's make but that my decision. Sure, then. sure. I certainly won't say anything about it. Okay. Okay, well, thanks very much, Frank, and uh, we'll, uh, I'll ask Ann to come in and Good. we can talk some more. Okay. Mediators use the caucus for several reasons. First, and most important, to gather information that the parties might be unwilling to disclose in a joint session. In the caucus with Anne, she revealed her difficult financial circumstances and her interest in starting a Cajun restaurant. Frank told me about his offer from Grandpa's Beans. Second, mediators used the caucus to exchange information. Here I was able to let Frank know that Anne would consider opening a Cajun restaurant in his building. A third use of the caucus is to help the parties negotiate. Here I helped Frank understand his circumstances better, and I made suggestions to Frank about his negotiating strategy. And finally, a caucus is a good way to build trust and rapport. During these caucuses, we continued to work on task two, understanding the problems, and we began to work on task three, developing options. In order to develop options, 
We all had to find out the party's underlying interests. When I learned that Anne had an interest in opening a Cajun restaurant, I asked questions that would help the parties develop the option of Anne renting Frank's building for that restaurant. At this point in the mediation, some mediators would have chosen to keep the parties separate. They would have conducted shuttle diplomacy by carrying proposals back and forth. But I felt that under the circumstances, the parties would be happier with any resulting agreement if they worked it out directly with one another. In the next segment, I bring the parties back together. We complete our work on developing options and then move on to task four, reaching agreement. Well, after our private meetings, it seems to me as if we have two different kinds of options that we've been talking about. One, and what we were looking at toward the beginning of this session, was ending the relationship and working toward somehow trying to return the equipment to Anne and somehow having Frank satisfied with respect to the financial situation. The other option, which I've discussed with both of you, uh, is the possibility that Anne would open a Cajun restaurant on the premises. And Anne, uh, I should tell you that I've discussed this with Frank, and it has some appeal. He has some concern about getting an appropriate rent. Well, yeah, in fact, you see, if you could do it, I want the same rent you agreed to, to before. Well, there's no way I can do that. Well, okay, if you can't do that, what's your offer then? I mean, let's, let's talk about what you can do. Be realistic. Uh, let's see if you could pay me enough rent to make it worth my while there. Come on, make me an offer. Well, I, I'm a little hesitant at this point because I'm afraid that whatever I say, you're going to, you know, just discount oh, or... Well, come on, I mean, this is you business. You go to such extremes with things. Well, I've got to have, I gotta have something to that. work with. Come well, on, get, well, give me a figure. Well, let's, let's hold up a second. And what kind of information do you think you'd need before you'd be in a position to talk about rent? Um, I don't... I don't really know. I mean, I don't know what I need. All I know is that I am worried about uh, my cash flow right off the bat. I, it's not going to be, you know, all that significant, I wouldn't think. I've got to establish a clientele um, and, and get things in order. And I would think that I'd, you know, I'd need things to be pretty pretty I need a pretty low rent I think to start off with because you know they're going to be a lot of costs and I don't know how the business is going to go or that kind of thing so I'm real hesitant to throw out a number at at this point well, okay but we can't have a lease with, without a, a definite rent and I mean, we got to make a deal somehow now I I agree with you that you're not going to do a, a tremendous gross in there the first few months cuz frankly, and you're not going to have the money to spend on advertising and promotion that would, would bounce that uh, clientele up in a hurry, are you? Mm. Mm. So, so would it make sense to talk about a lease in which the rent uh, is lower in the beginning and then escalates after a while? And, mm. uh, Can you do that? Sure. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, would that be a sensible way to go here? And, yeah. and, and I've I done that before. The, yeah. the percentage of gross could be adjusted as well. Yeah. Would, I, I'm wondering if that would make sense, given that it sounds like it would take a while to develop the business. Yeah. And you might be in a position to pay more rent later than you would be in the beginning. Well, here, here's what I'd say now. If, if we start with a low fixed rent, and we ought to offset that with a high percentage rent, but that won't add up to very many dollars if your business isn't so good to start with. That would be, a lot, that'd be a lot safer for me. I think I could, you know, yeah, it, I don't want to set something up that I can't meet. Yeah. If we do it that way, you know, I'm kind of becoming your partner to some extent. In other words, I, if you don't do so well, I'm kind of stuck holding part of the bag. But if you do well, which, which frankly, I kind of think you will, then in the long run, we could both be better off. So I, I'd be willing to, to make some concession on the fixed part of the rent or, uh, you know, until, you, until your business kind of gets up to speed. Clearly, there was still much that the parties had to work out. They had to decide who would pay for renovations, for example, and Anne was not clear on how much cash she would have available. But after considerable discussion, they reached a tentative agreement to enter into a five-year lease. For the first 18 months, the rent would be $450 per month plus 10% of gross receipts. For the second 18 months, $600 plus 7.5% of gross. And for the last two years, 800 plus 5% of gross. 
They agreed to include a clause in the lease stating that they would try to mediate any disputes that arose under the lease. Anne planned to discuss these terms with her brother-in-law, an accountant, and with her lawyer. While the parties themselves negotiated the actual terms of the agreement, during the last part of the mediation, I did several things to assist them. The first was to articulate the two options we had developed. Second, I tried to keep them focused productively on the option they both wanted to pursue. Here I had to keep Frank from pushing too hard in order for Anne to have time to work out her situation. Third, I suggested a concept that would help meet their unique needs, a fixed rent that started low and would escalate, and a percentage of gross that started high and would decline. Fourth, I encouraged them to reach a tentative agreement that would be subject to ratification or further negotiations after Anne consulted with her accountant and lawyer. After the parties reach an agreement, the final task is to implement it. This consists of reducing the agreement to written form and carrying it out. The mediator may or may not draft the agreement. The parties may write it up themselves, or they may choose to have their attorneys do so. In some cases, follow-up sessions are scheduled to monitor the implementation of an agreement. In this case, the parties agreed that Anne's lawyer would prepare the first draft of the lease and that Anne would send it to Frank. If problems arose during the drafting or final negotiations, the parties might come back into mediation. Once the lease is executed, both parties will move ahead to carry it out and they may return to mediation if they run into trouble in the future. In the course of this mediation, Anne and Frank improved their working relationship. Although Frank tried to dominate, Anne ignored his tactics and Frank became much more reasonable as a result. So one important goal of mediation can be to help the parties better understand each other's situations and needs so they can communicate more effectively. Obviously, this goal is not appropriate in all mediations and mediators must exercise judgment and restraint to avoid imposing their own ideas for solution. In mediation, after all, the parties to a dispute or transaction can gain control of their problem and tailor a solution to fit their own individual needs.